I think everybody can agree that the technology exists. It's here. There was no question about that. I think the retailers, they had so many ups and lows in the last couple of years. The pandemic was a shock down. And then 2021 was a shock up because it yeah. was such a good and Now they're coming back to reality. I think everybody understands that technology is not a choice. It's not an option. It's a, it's a must have. The big question is which technology. So flat out, everybody already has the supply chain concept or their management. There's a lot of talk about RFID and smart shelves and things like that. And I truly think that the kind of vision inside the stores is really the next big wave that's coming yeah. in. What a wonderful introduction to so, the webinar. That was a lovely way to kind of intro the various technologies that are available at NRF, <laughs> how we're seeing the market come to play. So hello and welcome to everyone that's just joined. And welcome to the Aurovision's third webinar in our series. This is our first show of 2023. And it's my, my absolute pleasure to have the renowned Ronnie Max joining me today to discuss some of the challenges and solutions that retailers have when implementing in-store analytics. So we're looking specifically at the experience economy and how brick and mortar retailers are evolving. So for those of you that may not know, Ronnie Max is actually a titan of the in-store analytics industry. She's an author, a speaker, and executive coach. She was a domain expert on the Stanford University Vision Project back in 2015, which is one of the first ventures to explore how AI technologies could actually improve physical retail. And so in 2017, Ronnie founded the Behavior Analytics Academy and coined and developed the in-store optimization framework, which is an important way for retailers to think about implementing innovation into their physical stores. And so welcome, Ronnie. Thank you for, for joining us on the show. Thank you, Daniel, for inviting me. It's going to be fun. <laughs> Brilliant. So we're going to talk through three questions today, which have bubbled up from common questions we get from prospects and retail clients on how they think about introducing in-store analytics technologies into their stores. So the first question we're going to look at today is how can retailers link their in-store and online data? This is probably the most common question, like how can retailers become omnichannel? And so this has really come up from one of the, one of the use cases from a luxury footwear retailer that we work with in the UK, where they've managed to implement quite a sophisticated system that allows them, allows customers to come into the store, browse the products, and then actually order those products on their phone from the website while in store. And it's proven great. It's loads of uplift for, for the retailer. It's streamlined some of their operations in the store because they don't need as much stock and they're not turning over as much stock in the store. But it kind of opens out that question of, okay, but how can we actually understand why and when and where customers are making these purchases in the store. They can link some of those data points, but they have no idea what led up to that purchase still, because it's just a mobile visiting a web page from within the store and making a purchase. So they don't get that prerequisite journey before the purchase. So this particular retail and similar retailers are looking at how can they capture in-store data and then combine that with those online sales. So I'd love to kind of turn that over to you, Ronnie, and get your thoughts on, I guess, firstly, should retailers even be attempting to link online and offline data? And if so, what are the best approaches for that? Okay, so the first answer is attribution. But the challenge here is attribution. What they really want to do is we have a very well-defined journey in the online world, and we're trying to figure out the beginning of the journey inside the physical store. That's really what they want to do, okay? Now, technically, you can do it in different ways. The question is, should you do it? Okay. And the trick here is what I call the opt-in point or the enrollment point. There has to be a situation in which the customer actually turns into the opt-in world. And we'll talk about it in a second. But before that, I want to step a little bit backwards and really explain the difference between personalization and segmentation, because I think that's where a lot of people uh, misunderstand why the attribution challenge is different, okay? In the online world, the way you think about a, the customer journey is really individual. You have an individual customer journey. Whether you understand who the customer is or not, you still have an individual customer journey, okay? So 
The way you pers personalize the customer journey is that you see where they are in the specific part of the website and you adapt that website or the page or the movement or the activity or the wordings or the colors based upon what you perceive that person is actually doing. That's personalization. But in order for personalization to actually exist, you have to understand the segmentation. So segmentation is actually the bedrock of using customer journeys because you want to understand the type of customer that are going into the store. So for instance, you and I are going to go to the store, but let's say that both of us have a very short patient, uh, which means we want to go, find what we want and get out. Okay. In that sense, you and I are exactly the same. Our objective in the store is to go fast, find what we want and get out. Okay, so let's say you were mentioning footwear, right? We both want boots that are fit for London during this time, during the winter, but you are a man and I'm a woman, okay? So, so the point is, what do we do inside the store? So the trick here is that while our journey online is very specific, our journey together inside the store is very different. And you don't need to know that my name is Ronnie and your, your name is Daniel. Yeah. What you do need to know is that both you and I came in together into the store. Okay. It's interesting. Now, this is exactly what we do as well, because we, we segment the, the demographics of everyone that comes into the store. But I think the immediate question from a retailer will be, well, why can't you get an individual journey in the store and then link that to that individual journey from the online data? Well, you can if you want to, because you have the last minute. You know when they actually purchased, you have a time space, you have a location. You want to do it, you can. Legally, you shouldn't. I don't think you should really care about this this much. Why? Yeah. Because it doesn't make any difference. The journey inside the store is segmented. And especially in footwear, what you really need is the ability to react to scenarios. If you and I come in as two people, we're a shopping group, okay? The way shopping groups work is that they have a very distinct behavior inside. We will go together to the women and then we will go to, together to the men's, okay? So this is where the interaction comes in because the fact that we walked in together has an impact on how you shop and has an impact on how I shop. So when you say it's better to say that retailers shouldn't obsess so much about linking the individual journeys, but focus more on combining those segmentations together across the different channels that people are purchasing on. No, they should think about the store in a different way than they should think about the journey online. The key here is on customer service, not on anything else. So what you want to do is to understand exactly where the customer is and the time. And this is, by the way, the beauty of computer vision. Computer vision gave us time-based matrix. Yeah. Time-based matrix are the ability to really understand a, the why behind the purchase, okay? Because if I come in and I just browse, there's a the lack of interest. But let's say that we're both interested in booth. I will stop at the booths area, okay? Yeah. I will stop and I will start looking. And at that point, once I cross a certain threshold, there has to be some kind of an associate there to come and help me to find the right shoes. So there is a certain point, the trigger, it's an alert that needs to happen. There is a customer, they're there after a certain period of time, let's say 30 seconds, 60 seconds, it depends on the type of product and where you are in the store. The, somebody has to be there. Now, here comes another sophisticated concept, especially in footwear, the concept of what we call the halo effect, okay? Mm -hmm. The halo effect means that one category impacts another category. So if you come into a footwear store and you're going to go and buy shoes, there's some other stuff you may want to buy, like socks oh, or, a, or brushes or things like that. These are accessories, okay? So you can actually find a way of adding these accessories. Another part that's really important in the yellow effects is let's say, for instance, you went in the store and you went in for the boots, okay? And you couldn't find your boots. You may go to a different kind of shoes, 
Mm-hmm. There's a whole bunch of retailers, and unfortunately, I cannot share with you. The brand shoe kind of impacts the boots and vice versa. Oh. So you can do some studies to understand how certain segmented customers relate to each other. It's a, it's a really wonderful way of trying to uh, combine these two. And then you can add like a promotion, like a two for one. It's like, okay, if you bought one, you can add another one. This is where the halo effect really Mm -hmm. works very, very well. So there's different ways of dealing with it. You just have to work with the data enough and to really segment your your customers. Thinking about promotions is actually segues really nicely into the next question, which is how to prove the ROI of seasonal campaigns. So when we look thinking about marketing, thinking about changing the store, running campaigns, that's often a big challenge for retailers to justify the costs and the, the ROI essentially of making these, these large wider edging changes across their retail estates. So this has really come from one of the big box sporting goods retailers that we work with who go through these seasonal changes every quarter. And it's just in their mandate that the store has to be refit, stock has to be moved, They have to put up the new visual merchandising promotions, but no one inside the company actually knows what the ROI of making these changes are. They they sure know the costs of doing it, but they don't actually know if that's proving uplift or not. It's just something they've always done. So they've come to us. And and one of the big questions is how can I prove out, you know, if these changes are actually driving sales, if they're actually worthwhile from a customer behavior point of view. So I'd really love to get your view, Ronnie, on how you would best approach that with a retailer that was just starting out, thinking about collecting this data and then actually going and actioning it at a later stage. Okay, so again, there's different parts to this question, okay? People come to the store to see the changes. If you are a regular customer, you come to the store to see the changes. Otherwise, there's no reason for you to to come, okay? This is why retailers come in all the time with new ideas and new products. There's a reason you come back to the store, okay? So there has to be a change. The question is where the change is and how you do the change, okay? So for instance, a lot of stores, especially in fashion, will have what we call the premium displays, the one in the front, in the storefront, on which you want to make the changes happen, okay? Trick here is how do you understand that it makes sense? Well, first of all, you look at the patterns, it's the number one thing that you want. You want to understand your baseline. How many people actually come in and look at those promotionals? And then you change it and you see how many people react to the change. I'll give you an example. A conversation I just had this week. The colors of the seasons are deep colors. Okay, they're black, they're deep brown, deep green. These are the colors that are coming out right now. Okay, well, they don't fit everybody. Some people like it more. So somebody made a comment that they don't think it works. And I was like, okay, well, you guys made the decision because this is like a a fashion thing. You you made a decision to do this. You put a lot of stuff. So the big question is, how do you improve the sales of a color that doesn't work? Well, you put it with color that does work because the reason it works together is because they tune. And that comes directly inside the way you do the display. So one of the things that we were discussing was how do you actually change the display? This is, again, an A-B testing concept, okay? You made the display in a certain way. Well, you choose the colors of the system because they work together. So let's change the display in a certain way and see if it may change. And they did change the display and the initial data is looking good. So the point here is that you need to start somewhere. You need to understand the baseline. And then you need to understand how it impacts. So I'll give you another example, store windows. Okay, When you look at store windows, you have an attention. Okay? There's a certain way to think about the attention. Okay, are, you, are we seeing the windows? Did the windows make a difference? Well, if your store is in a mall, you know how many people pass by and you know how many people Enter. Well, you want to see whether people actually stop. And if they stop, where did they look at? By the way, if you're doing a, a testing between logo or product recognition and brand recognition, again, the numbers will tell you. So there's a lot of stuff that the data can 
can tell you. We talked, I think, about experimental retail also. It's funny that you mentioned window displays because we're working with another luxury retailer, multi-brand retailer this time that have these huge, incredibly expensive digital displays in their window. And so part of the business case we're building with them is A-B testing the content on those displays, which is just a free win, essentially, understanding which content is capturing the most traffic into the entrance of the store. So going back to that data, Ronnie, so when you're looking at displays, are you looking simply at the uplift in engagement or impressions or average time spent of that display? Or would you go one step further and try and actually link that back to the sales performance of that display or that particular department? How would you link those two data sets together to actually prove out the ROI from an A-B test like this? Okay, this is a perfect question because it comes back to the difference between the online and the offline. The online you don't care about. You, you can do everything with anonymous data because you do have, at the end of the day, you can see how many people actually were in that next to that display, how many people interacted with the display, and you know the sales at the end of the day. Okay, so I can give you like, for instance, for the sake of simplicity, 100 people walked into the store, okay? And about 15% of them stood in front of the display. Now, out of those 15 people, 10 of them spend about, let's say less than a minute. And five of them spend more than a minute. You wanna see whether the sales conversion for that display is 5%. So if you have less than that 5%, you want to figure out why. More important, you want to try and figure out how do you increase that 5%. So the trick here is that there's a lot of ways to build a much bigger picture that has nothing to do with specific people, but rather the way they react inside the store. Yeah. The way you segment them inside the store. Remember, I think we talked about a, a sportswear company, okay? Yeah. Sportswear is very, very, very interesting because you can segment it in different ways. You can segment it by the type of sports, okay? So let's say for a, a, an example, ski, okay? I have no idea about ski, okay? I live in Florida, so I have no idea about <laughs> ski. But I know it's cold. So if I walk into the store, let's say... I see the ski and I decide, I look at it and I say, oh, great, I want to ski. But you know what? I have zero understanding of any kind of ski. But if it says, oh, this is for beginners, I'm like very happy because it tells me that whether I like it or not, that's the right board for me. Okay, sure. and this is true for rackets and that's true for the tennis records, for tennis balls, for anything that is sport oriented and requires some kind of, of knowledge. Okay. That's yeah. segmentation. The same here is that you might get a lot of engagement with a display like skiing, for example, but it might not be actually relevant to a lot of people engaging with it. So you want that further segmentation, either more targeting with the display or navigating them to a new area of the store. And that's a, a key way that you can actually prove out did that display work or not? Did it actually navigate more traffic into that department or was it not targeted well and actually traffic navigates away from that after engaging with it because you might put the display in a, a busy area of the store like right at the entrance and it's going to get loads of engagement no matter what content it has on it so looking at that in itself might not actually be incredibly exploratory it might actually be valuable hold on, hold on a second this is where the data surprises you you kind of assume that there's a certain level of engagement but once you look at the data, you realize there's a different levels of engagement depending on your display and depending on, on the products, depending on how the display works. So again, test everything. The key is that if you work with the data, the data will tell you the story. So it comes um, back to what are you using as that benchmark, as that baseline to measure uplift, beautiful. right? So you have to control for as many things as possible so that you can have a, the A and the AB test of your benchmark. And I think that is the challenge with seasonal campaigns a lot is that if you're constantly changing every area of the store, every season, it becomes challenging to decide like, what is your benchmark? Is it the same season last year? Which doesn't really answer the question, should we change the store every, every season or is it season by season? And then you've got obviously seasonal effects that come in. So I think, Part of the answer for this for, for a lot of retailers is just control and change one thing at a time so you can have that that benchmark when you go and do that a b test you can be confident that 
when you see that B result, you know it's an uplift from the A that you're, you're confident is actually the correct benchmark to be comparing to. And now we're coming into actually the most dangerous part of the conversation with any kind of retailers, okay? Which is the relationship between corporate and the store, okay? Because corporate has a certain way of doing things. The planograms, their planning, the way they work together and they send it out to the stores and they basically tell the store exactly how that worked. But I can tell you that every single time that I went to a stores with vendors and the vendor was very busy with the corporate manager and the big VPs, I used to sit around with the store manager. And by definition, statements I always heard is like, they can do whatever they want. I will do what I need to do in order to increase my sales. Yeah. So that's true about where they put the merchandise yeah. and how they move people around and it doesn't make any difference. And they're absolutely correct. And I'll give you a concrete example. In this conversation, one of the things that came up is that the products in a certain color look differently, mm. whether you're in a high street store or whether you're in a mall store. The light is different. So certain assumptions about the storefronts just don't work yeah. the same way. So there's some things that you need to listen to the stores. And that kind of communication cannot grow unless you have a two-way communications and you have a system that uses data. I'll give you another concrete example on ROI seasonal campaigns. That actually happened years ago. They did a seasonal fashion. They did a seasonal campaign and it was a big success in one store and it was a disaster in another store. And these stores were similar enough that there was absolutely no logical reason why they couldn't sell the same, okay? And here's what we found out. We found out that in the successful store, they had a really nice area with a very large mirror in it. And it was very pretty. And fitting rooms were also very pretty. So it was very easy to try on the clothes. It was just easy. It was nice. It was pleasant. It was a lot of fun. But on the other store, I had almost no mirrors. And because it was an older store, the way the fitting rooms looked, they didn't look posh. They didn't look nice. And that was a huge impact. And we're talking difference of about 20% sales points. I think this okay. is a really fascinating point, Ronnie, because this is my personal experience coming into founding Aura Vision, working in retail on the shop floor and seeing this huge disconnect between corporates and what's actually happening on the ground. And it was just such a surprise to me that I realized we had some technology that could start answering this question, essentially, and kind of bridge that gap. And this kind of leads really nicely into the last question, which is, what is the point of having in-store customer journey data? And this kind of comes back to this whole thing of like the disconnect between corporate and what's happening in the store. And corporate might be using this data, you know, they're used to footfall data. They're used to driving actions from the conversion rate or a store not having enough traffic. But when you start moving into other teams within an organization that are more and more disconnected from the in-store experience, the kind of understanding of why they need these insights and why they need to be communicating with store associates becomes more and more kind of <laughs> uncertain to them. When you start talking to store design and visual merchandising and they've got their fixed processes and they often question, like, well, what's the point? Why, why do I care about engagement with this new visual merchandising display? Or why do I care about if people are navigating to this area of the store after having refit these? We've already spent the money refitting the stores. I don't want to know <laughs> if this works or not, essentially. So this is kind of change management. There's often a lot of politics around, you know, telling people they're wrong and often not supporting the assumptions that they had to make in order to, to drive those decisions. So it's really interesting. I'd love to get your kind of hot take on how you've seen potentially install analytics data being a little bit contentious in the organization and trying to battle some of these, some of these questions of like, what's the point of having it? Why should I actually start using it? The biggest challenge is that most retailers think about optimization of stores as, okay, we're going to spend a lot of money and re remodel, get in 30% lift, and then we're going to go home. 
Okay. Exactly. But the reality is that every single thing that they do in the store has an impact on the sales. Every single activity, every day, the way their customers come in and work, the way the products are done, these are all dynamic aspects of it. So if every week you introduce a new product, you effectively change something in the store. If you brought in, you hired somebody new, you effectively change something in the store. So right now, they're simply used to working without data. This is the biggest challenge. It just, they've never had data in the store. Let's take an example from the online world. When Google Analytics yeah. started, duh, why do I need to know exactly how many people walk into, why? That's, that was the conversation. And yeah. today, digital and online digital analytics is very, very sophisticated. The same thing is going to happen inside the store. Absolutely. Take a simple thing like people counting. People counting, I remember 20 years ago, nobody really cared about it. A lot of people don't care about it today. But people counting is really about the basis for demand analytics. Yeah. And demand analytics is significantly sophisticated. So the first statement is you need to move away from this whole concept that the store is tactical. This is the way they think. It's like the store is tactical. The store is not yeah tactical. The store is very dynamic. Okay. The other part is the way retailers think about the stories. And actually it's funny because we talked about NRF and I heard the lady who was the CEO of Vitamin Shop talk about her experience as an undercover boss. The big thing that she was so surprised is how busy the people in the store are and how much they understand about the store, the things that she would have never known. There's not enough respect, I think, in corporate to the people inside the store. And once you start respecting them, and once you start thinking about them more, not as a temporary employees, but as more sophisticated and long-term employees, and you want to invest in them, then you suddenly realize that they can tell you a lot of stuff about the store. Going back to corporate then, what would you say to... Say like a store design leader who they're disconnected a little bit from what's happening in the store, but you know they're, they're tasked with refitting 50% of the retail estate and they've got this mandate to do it. How would you how would you explain to them the importance of having insights and analytics from the stores that they've never used before? What would you say to them to actually get them engaged in, in using data to drive their decision making? Well, I usually listen to where they start. So I'll give you a concrete example. So last year I was in Europe, I was sitting with a retailer and his biggest challenge was that he had stores in malls and because it was in the beauty area, they put all the beauty companies together. So he said, there's five stores of beauty and we're just one of them. So how we, how we distinguished ourselves. And I said, do you know your customers? Is there a specific thing that really brings people to your store? He said, absolutely. I said, do you have like a, a, a very distinct brand? He said, absolutely. So I said, don't you think the people in your store know exactly why people come in? And he was like, well, yeah, I know they know because I know this store manager and I know this store. And I said, so don't you go and just ask them and they will tell you exactly what they need, why people are coming in. There's exactly. no better way. I mean, there's just, you know, you spend tons of money on mystery shoppers and you made tons of money on a online surveys. And the best thing you can do is just talk to people inside the store. There's nothing better. The sales are online. So when we start talking about customer journey, you have to start thinking in terms that the, Journeys are combined. This is, again, goes back to your original question, which was on the online and offline. The online world is personalized, but personalization just means it's a Chinese menu of segmentation. Mm -hmm. The offline is segmented. What you really want to understand is segmentation. And we're going back to, let's say, this is where a lot of people fall. They do this linear concept. When you do the maps, the customer journey data maps, you do a linear concept. 
it simply does not work today. People don't go from one point to another. This is where the online and offline world diverge. Brilliant. Ronnie, this is fantastic. It was so informative, incredibly broadening the horizons of our understanding of what retailers can do in their stores. Just to quickly summarize some of the points that you've come up with today. So how can we link in-store data and online data? The big message here is, is personalization versus segmentation and using that segmentation information from the in-store to link to those personalized journeys online. When we were talking about proving out the ROI for seasonal campaigns, I think we agreed that benchmarking is really key, making sure that we control for all those external factors so that we can actually prove out what the uplift is of the change that we're testing. What's the point of having your customer journeys? I think the take home I got here from, from what you said is that actually talking to your customers is is the most valuable way of being able to understand what they need. And so measuring that it, through analytics, is the best way of doing that at scale in a continuous way. Wonderful. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for the time today. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you so much, Ronnie, for your incredibly valuable time.